but a human being develops his faculties of attention, only then are you more capable of addressing the reality for what it is. So you can start to experience things without prejudice. Once you experience things without prejudice, you're just seeing the reality for what it is, neither liking, neither disliking, not projecting your ideas of what's right or wrong, good or bad, what should be or should not be, just simply being in tune with what is, whatever that may be. What is may be pleasant or unpleasant, but still, if you're able to create just a small distance in your experience between the observer in you and that which is being observed, then you find a certain inner flexibility starts happening. In yoga, this kind of flexibility is called vairagya. Vairagya literally means being without color. It's a bit like, uh, I talked about this in a previous class. Suppose we have a bowl of water. If we put red ink into the bowl, the water becomes red, but the nature of the water doesn't change. If you put blue ink into the bowl, the water becomes blue, but still the water, the nature of the water doesn't change. Or if we take this water, we put it into a cup, it becomes the shape of a cup. If we put it into a square, it becomes the square. If we put it into a circle, it becomes the circle. That's how a human being should be. His approach to life should be he, as if he's like water, just adapting moment to moment. Whatever happens to cross your path, you're flexible, responding to life not out of predetermined structures, predetermined patterns. So we should not be approaching life out of our, out of our ideas of morality. Morale, the idea of morality means you're approaching every situation with a certain fixed pattern. You think something is right, you think something is wrong, and you're approaching certain situations with a prejudice. But just like medicine, it's exactly like medicine. What might be useful in one situation, in another situation, the same thing will not work. That's why exactly how, that's how if you go to a doctor, the doctor, he does not just give a general prescription for every single condition. He knows very well there's different kinds of medicine to address different kinds of problems. Now you think, perhaps out of your morality, oh, it's a sin to kill life. Tell me, can any human being live on this world without killing a single human creature, a single living creature? Just me sitting here speaking, just here me sitting breathing, I'm killing thousands of microorganisms. Or if a human, if a animal is dying slowly and 100% you know it's going to die, you understand it very well that to kill it in a single moment would be a much more compassionate action than just letting it drag on its sufferings unnecessarily. So what is the quality of the mind that's beneath the actions? Actions have no quality by themselves. So you're killing. Are you killing out of greed? Or perhaps you've killed somebody accidentally? Or perhaps it's out of compassion? So depending on the intention that's behind your action, you will create what we're calling different types of karma. The word karma just simply means action. Every single kind of action you perform in life has certain effects. And besides that, what is it that makes the character of a human being? Anybody have ideas about that? What is it that makes the personality of a human being? Yes. Suppose you were born in this world and you are not capable of having experience. Suppose you had no experience at all. How would your personality be? Or suppose somebody in this world, you know there are some people who are not born with five senses. Some people are born, let's say, 
with only one sense intact, only touch, for example. If that was the case for you, wouldn't you have a very different kind of personality? So most of what molds and shapes our personality is just all the impressions and memories we've ever experienced from birth to the present moment. So the total sum of all the impressions and memories that have gathered in your mind, this is what makes the character of a human being. So usually we think when a certain experience comes and goes that it has totally disappeared. But it's not so. Every experience is a bit like ripples and waves on the surface of your mind's lake. They don't just disappear. Every imp impression, it sinks down beneath the conscious mind and into your unconscious, and it gathers force there. So this is why some people who, let's say, they're repressing sexual desire, they go on repressing it day by day, day by day. They simply turn out to become totally perverted. Because that's what your mind is like. Your mind is a bit like a sponge. Let's say you're in a deep sleep, and there's the sound of running water in the background. And we can take you to a psychologist. He will put you in a certain state, state of hypnosis and he can rem make you remember exactly what it is you had experienced. Because that's exactly what your mind is like. Your mind is like a sponge. Whether you're aware of what's happening or unaware of what's happening, it simply absorbs everything that's entering into you. So, unless we learn to become more conscious of this mind, more conscious of the mental processes, as they're not as an idea, we're not talking about psychological analysis. We're saying, we're talking about direct observation of your own mind. To see the mind ex as it is in the moment. And that's the only place where self-knowledge can begin. Self-knowledge can only begin through the door of this present moment. Past is gone forever. You cannot observe the past. Future has not yet arrived. You cannot observe the future either. The only thing that you're able to observe within yourself is what's happening in this present moment. So, everything that's in the whole spirit of meditation is present-oriented, anchoring your attention into the present moment. When I say anchoring your attention into the present moment, I do not necessarily mean that you cannot put your thought processes to use in the world, or you cannot put your imagination to use in the world. It's even possible for thought processes to pass by in your mind, and still you're remaining a witness at a distance. You're not becoming identified. So, in a single word, to observe without attachment. Just see. The moment you become attached to anything that's arising in your experience, whether pleasant or unpleasant, you lose all clarity of vision. And whatever, your, whatever strengthens your attachment also strengthens your egotism. And how much of the human problems are connected to the ego? Almost all human problems are directly connected to the ego. So, development of this more refined kind of attention is part of the whole process of meditation. And that's the beauty of meditation. It can be done anywhere, anytime, at any place. There's no reason why there should be a single act that should be excluded from your meditation. So I want you to completely dispel that idea in your mind that meditation is about sitting meditation. It's not about the posture of the body. If you're walking, but walking consciously, walking becomes walking meditation. Sitting, but sitting consciously, sitting becomes sitting meditation. Running, but running consciously, this becomes running meditation. Lying down, but lying down with your whole awareness, a flame of 
attention still continues burning within you. This becomes lying down meditation. It's a bit like a man who went to see one Zen master. He asked him, please teach me about meditation. So he just sat up straight in the proper posture. He waited to receive the teaching. So the master asked him, tell me something. What is it that you expect to get out of sitting meditation? What's the goal in your mind? He said, my goal is to be a Buddha. The word Buddha, it just simply, we're not talking about a particular person. If I say Buddha, maybe some of you are thinking Gautama Buddha. No, when we say Buddha, the word Buddha, it literally means the awakened one somebody who has come to a realization of what is his true nature. Such a person can be called a Buddha. So he said, I want to be a Buddha. I want to become an awakened one. I want to, re to know myself. Who am I? So the master, he picked up a brick. He started polishing the brick. The disciple seeing this was very confused. He said, Master, what do you think you are doing? The Master said, I'm trying to make a mirror out of polishing this brick. The disciple laughed. He said, Oh, don't you know that it's impossible to create a mirror out of polishing a brick? The Master said, in exactly the same way, how can you expect to realize your, your true nature only through sitting meditation? If you think the spirit of meditation is about sitting or not sitting, you've lost the whole point of what is meditation. You should know that true meditation is formless. It's not about the posture of the body. So any time in your life, if you're acting but acting consciously, which means you're just creating, again, a small distance in your experience between the witness within you and that which is being witnessed, then that becomes part of your meditation. And this witnessing intelligence is not something actually, it's wrong for me to say that it's something that you can do. Everybody in this room right now is aware. Isn't it so? Are you doing it? Or is it simply happening? Simply happening. There's a group of scriptures in India called the Upanishads and they gave a very beautiful analogy of what is a human being. They said a human being is a bit like a chariot. Now what are the parts of this chariot? The physical chariot is the physical body. The horses of the chariot, your arms, your legs, your organs of action that you're using to carry yourself through in the world. These are the horses of the chariot. In the chariot, there's the driver of the chariot. Now who's the driver of the chariot? As the driver of the chariot, he has to make so many decisions when he's driving on the road. He has to be aware of so many things. He has to be aware of, okay, what is the route that I have to travel? What are the other drivers on the road? What is the weather today? This driver is the discrimination of your intellect. It's through the discrimination of your intellect and the judgments of the intellect that you're performing so many actions in the world. So you're gravitating in this way in life or when experience, experiencing a certain situation, you have to make a decision, okay, should I behave in this way? Should I behave in that way? So this is the discrimination of your intellect. Besides the driver of the chariot, however, there's also another character in the chariot, the rider of the chariot. And he's just sit, simply sitting there as a witness, just seeing whatever's happening in the scene and not judging, as if he's just sitting there in front of a movie screen and images are passing by in the mind. So I've always given an analogy that this witnessing intelligence within you, it's not my awareness, it's not your awareness, his awareness, her awareness. Awareness is simply awareness.
And this awareness is exactly like a mirror. You put anything in front of the mirror, the mirror doesn't say, it's totally non-critical. It doesn't say, I like this, I'm going to, I want to hang on to it. I dislike this, I want to escape from it. The mirror simply reflects. And that's the beauty of awareness. It simply reflects things as they are. So even if there's delusion that's happening in your mind, delusion can happen in your mind, but if there's just a small distance in your experience, you don't have to become delusional. Does that make sense? Because after all, most of your mind is just delusion, isn't it? It's just an interpretation of the reality. So, that's why everybody in this world is having a subjective experience of life. That means for each person's mind, he's producing a different kind of dream. You're sitting there, you're hearing my voice in one way. If you're just out there in the hall, you'll hear the sound of my voice in a, different, in a totally different way. Which one is a more accurate representation of the reality? You don't know. It's just your own mental impressions, your own mental perceptions.